Welcome to the show both feared and revered by Man and Beast, the Helios blog. Today, Jordan Peterson annihilates Donald Trump. This should be good. The reason she's alone is because she's difficult. Women are not accepting the bare minimum. Women fuck men they respect. All the women who say things like, I'm strong, independent, I don't need no man, like, y'all impress me. Women just gaslight each other and say what they want to hear. Soros is a guy that's worth, I don't know, $20 billion guy. He's a guy that is hated by the right, and a lot of people on the right think he is manipulative, deceptive, and he wants to inject his philosophies politically to this country. But here's what he said. He says, that this is a Bloomberg article. Soros says, China's real estate crisis, Omicron, threatens Xi rule. Billionaire philanthropist George Soros and China's Xi Jinping may fail to extend his rule of the country later this year. In contrast to what most observers expect, Soros cited Xi enemies within the party, real estate crisis, ineffective vaccines, and a failing birth rate as factors working against him. Internal divisions in China are so sharp that it has found expression in various party publications, Soros said. Xi is under attack from those who are inspired by Deng Xiaoping's ideas and want to see a greater role for private enterprise. Mm. What do you think is going to happen with Xi and China? Well, my sense of it, and I'm definitely no expert, is that it's not easy for the Chinese to maintain internal unity. And so they tend to focus on that, and perhaps that's partly why China hasn't been as expansionist a power as it might have been. Maybe that's changed to some degree in recent years. But it's, it's a very large country. It has an incredibly diverse population. And so they have their own problems, their own internal problems, which are significant and, and preoccupying. And so I hope that they stay focused on their internal problems and that they stay focused on solving them. I mean, China has been forward-looking enough, thank God, to allow the free market enterprise to flourish despite the proclivity for implementing top-down, radical left state solutions. And the consequence of that has been, first of all, now China is a player in the international scene, for better or worse, I think mostly for better. I know that a lot of that was accomplished on the backs of the American working class, and that's catastrophic in many ways. But the fact that there aren't tens of millions of Chinese people starving that's a really good thing for international security and stability, and that's of no trivial benefit to the American working class as well. And the fact is that China makes a lot of cheap stuff that works, mostly, and that people who are more stressed economically have also benefited to that to a tremendous degree. So it seems that all of that has been good. The twist towards a more totalitarian mode of governance in the last 10 years, that's obviously extremely worrisome. The fact that China is a totalitarian state has had a very negative consequence on us in the West, especially in the immediate, uh, what would you call it, in the immediate emergence of the, of the pandemic, because what we did was we rushed to imitate a totalitarian state. We thought, Chinese lockdown, we better do it. It's like, really? Really? We better do what the CCP did. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we did. And we'll see. We don't know what the consequence of that is yet. We'll see. Not good. Not good, in my estimation. And certainly the Johns Hopkins studies study seems to... It's only a partial study, in some sense. They've done the cost-benefit analysis. Costs so far. We have no idea what the costs are of having kids in masks for two years. We have no idea what the consequences are, what that's done, especially to introverted kids who are high in negative emotion, because they're going to be looking for a reason to hide anyways. And who knows what that's done to their psychological development, both as children and as adolescents. We'll find out over time, but we haven't paid the price for the pandemic lockdowns even a little bit yet. And did we destroy our economy? Like these things take a long time. You know, they say if you're piling an oil tanker and you detect an iceberg in your path, you can see it. You've already hit it because it takes so long for you to turn that it's too late. Well, in some sense, these huge systems that we're a part of are like that, is that 
you can't tell when they're broken because they take a long time to fall over. And I don't know if our system is broken, but we're going to find out. And I don't know if the pandemic... We're going to find out. ...lockdowns broke it. And maybe they didn't. And hopefully they didn't. I mean, I was in New York City, in Manhattan, a month ago. And it was the first time I'd really gone out anywhere other than Toronto. And I'd been to New York a few years before, and it's a bouncing place, Manhattan. I love New York. It's such an amazing city. You know, the fact that Manhattan can even exist is just an ongoing absolute miracle. Seven million people compressed onto that island, and it's, it's pretty damn clean, and it's pretty safe, and it's really cool, and there's something to do all the time, and you can walk around free, and like, that bloody place is a miracle. That's for sure. And it looked pretty good. I thought, isn't this something? These people have been locked down for like 18 months and this place isn't on fire. It actually is pretty clean and most of the businesses are still open and isn't that a bloody miracle, And which it most definitely is. And so let's pray and not be too resentful about all the foolishness. Let's pray that we wake up and we treat the pandemic like the flu and we get back to something resembling the normality of Florida and we put this behind us and we don't get too upset about January 6th and we don't get too vengeful about the Democrats and the radical left and we elect someone half sensible to run the Republicans and we carefully weave our way through to a peaceful future. We Let's pray for that because the alternative is pretty damn dismal <laughs> and I don't think we have to have the alternative. You know, one of that we talked about Trump earlier Here's my dilemma with Trump, one of many. Um, he's beating the election was stolen drum pretty damn hard. And I look at that as an outsider again, because I'm Canadian, and I think, well, you Americans, you've been split 50-50 for like five decades, like right down the middle. Eh? And there's always election trouble. Because no system is 100% perfect. Maybe there's like a 1%, 2% margin of crookedness, something like that. And you're probably really not going to get rid of that. Maybe you can maneuver carefully to keep it so that it's never any more than 1% or 2%. But to get rid of that last bit of malfeasance and deception and corruption would take such a heavy hand that that would become worse than the problem. And... That's a real problem when you're split 50-50 because small e election irregularities can throw the whole election. Okay, so it isn't obvious precisely what can be done about that. But the election was stolen narrative, I think it's weak for a variety of reasons. The first is, it's pretty whiny. Like, why didn't you win with 5% margin then? So how do you know this isn't your fault? And you think the Republicans aren't gerrymandering congressional districts? Because they are. And so it's not obvious that even if it is the case that there is substantive election fraud, that it's all from one side. And so there's that. And then, you're sure that's the message you want to be sending people? That they shouldn't have faith in their most fundamental institution? You might be right, but... But... <laughs> it's in your interest for that yep. to be true? And so that's a moral hazard. And then... Yeah, it's pretty, like... Again, the, the impression I'm getting in 2024 is that it's lots of BS, lots of uh, a tempest signifying nothing, right? But anyway, people going crazy about there going to be a civil war and all that. No, no, I, I doubt that very highly. People aren't really that warlike in 2024 as, as they used to be. I, I don't think... I mean, if, if um, you know, a certain event that uh, made us all wear masks for a few years is, is, to, um, is to be taken as, uh, as data, um, people are much more passive than uh, maybe we believe them to be. Well, what happens when you retake the House? Because that's what's going to happen. I think the Democrats are going to get stomped in the, in the upcoming election. Are those elections somehow valid, but yours wasn't? And so why magically when the Republicans get elected, that's honest, but when they don't, it's not? 
And so doesn't that take the wind out of your story? It's like, well, it was stolen. Well, you have the House and the Senate. How do you account for that? So that, to me, that, that's going to weaken that narrative. Trump is capitalizing on anger. He's using the election issue as a means to an end. And he may believe it, but it doesn't matter because it's a weak story, especially when the Democrats lose the House. It's a weak story. So it's not going to, it doesn't have any momentum. But then it, it's worse than that because I also think, and I've talked to lots of Republicans about this, is that the best story you've got? You got tradition on your side. You got the truth as an adventure on your side. You got belief in truth on your side. That's been abandoned by the radical left. You've got belief in science on your side. You've got responsibility on your side. You've got the fundamental purpose of higher education on your side. You can't conjure up a better story for Americans than the election was stolen when, with all that on your side. That's just not very impressive. And I have sympathy for politicians in general in the United States. Congress people have very hard jobs. It's not a job I would like. I don't think it's a pleasant job. They spend a lot of their time fundraising 25 hours a week on the phone out of their congressional offices because otherwise they're not supported by their party leadership. 40% of them sleep in their offices when they go to Washington. They don't even have apartments. Those that do usually have little bitty apartments. Their families aren't there because it's hard to get families to move to Washington now with dual career families. They don't have much of a social group. They have to run for their job every two years. This is not a... Plus, they're under attack all the time and they're micromanaged and micro-scheduled. So... But I'm curious, what point are you trying to make? Are you trying to make a point with Trump saying the fact that you know, election was stolen, because that's exactly what Hillary Clinton's position was for four years, that elections yeah, well, were stolen no, from no, her, no right? Better, no better when she does it. Oh, no, I'm not even, what I'm trying to say is I looked at it as a weak position. That, it is hey, a weak position. It is a weak position she was taking. I think, okay. but That's the worst of it. It's but, like, really? Where are you going with this? Are you going with the tell fact that- Tell a better that, story. Tell a better story if you want yeah. to get reelected? Is that no, 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 no. The way to re-election is through a better story, but that's not the reason to tell it. The reason to tell it is because you believe it. And the, for the first time in my life, really, I believe this to be the case, conservatives really have something to sell to young people. And they, have the, they can sell the meaning of responsibility because young people are bereft. Of well, not only this, they can sell anti-woke, right? Of meaning. And most people find meaning in responsibility. And, and when the right talks about responsibility, they kind of do it in that finger-wagging way that makes conservatives unpopular among young people. You should be responsible. It's like, yeah, you should. Why? Well, because your life is chaotic and meaningless and you're stuck in this juvenile surreality. And it's really painful for you and you're anxious and aimless and goalless. And then you look at people who have a life, because maybe you could have a life, and you think, well, what does that life consist of? It's like... Well, you have a committed, intimate relationship. There's one. You have friends that you're honest with and, and playful with. Mm -hmm. So you have a group of friends. You have a job or a career. You, know, you, you, you learn how to use your life, your time outside of work in a productive, engaging way. You regulate your susceptibility to the multitude of hedonistic temptations that are in front of you. Um, you pay some attention to your mental and physical health. You make a goal, some goals for the future that are concrete. Well, there's seven things you can do. They're all responsible things. Why? Because then your life will have some meaning. Now, you might say, well, what's the ultimate meaning? It's like, get those things straight first. They're not nothing. And maybe you won't be so damn miserable and bitter and resentful and angry and aimless and anxious and frustrated and disappointed and then ashamed if you had five of those seven things going well. And the conservatives can make that case. No bloody left isn't making that case. It's like for them, responsibility is pretty much equivalent to totalitarian patriarchal oppression. The conservatives could just take that and say, no, no, our institutions, they're pretty solid. Maybe if you don't like what's happening on the political front, you join a, a group, a church, uh, the Elks, the Rotary, some civic organization. Get in there and do your part. Why? Not because you should, even though you should, but because... Well, why not meet some people who are like-minded and have a social group? And you, 
you think Biden can can have the kind of impact to push people away from the political party to the opposing side, similar to how Goldwater and what they did back in the days on how civil rights was handled when Barry Goldwater did what he did, and next thing you know, African Americans went from uh, only 60 percent uh, of them voting. Uh, Democrat to 92% four years later. They went from 60% to 92% four years later in the next election. And Republicans haven't had a chance on the African American vote since 1964. Do you think the current climate is that big of a climate where the conversion from one side to the other side to say, listen, I don't agree with you guys on censoring. If the guys want to talk, leave them alone. The way you handle COVID by shutting everybody down, I don't agree with that. Constantly printing money, I don't agree with that. Do you think it could be something where it could flip that that big? I don't know, because 20, the next presidential election in this climate is a long way away. Because, you know, who can predict the future even a year out, especially given the rate of technological change that we face now? I mean, you don't even know what's happening today. There's so many technological transformations just today, many of which have world-shaping consequences. God only knows where we're going to be by the time of the next presidential election. But... It certainly does seem to me the case that the Democrats are going to lose big in the fall. And so, you know, that's that's what we'll focus on for the time being. So if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did, here's. A OK. If you were an American citizen, you were here in the 2020 election. Would you have voted for Trump, Biden, nobody or a third party candidate? I don't know. You know, you do, it's very hard to answer those questions until you're actually in the situation. When Clinton was facing off against Trump for a very long time, I felt that I would have voted for Clinton. I felt that she had the at least the administrative background and the governmental experience to know what the job was and to handle it. I felt that Trump was a wild card, which he most definitely was. Then I went to this... <laughs> The night of the election, I went to this Republican gala in Canada at a private club uh, watching the election, and they did a straw vote there. And in the straw vote, I cast my vote for Trump. And that surprised me. And it was something... That's because uh, Shillery was not exactly a good pick, right? I sort of switched on last minute. And the reason I switched, I would say, is because I thought Clinton betrayed the working class. In fact, that's why she lost the election. It isn't something I just felt. That's definitely what happened. And so I thought, to hell with you, you know, I'd rather have this wild card in here with his spontaneous lies than have you in here with your programmatic, powered, mad, driven, uh, pre-authorized lies. And so I don't know. It's hard to tell what you do in a situation until you're actually in it. Do you think Trump as president in his four years also betrayed the working class? Um, not in the same manner. No, really. And I think Trump did some things that were really quite spectacular. Uh, like one what? of them, like what? Well, how about no war? Well, he did assassinate a top Iranian commander. No, 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 who no. Was fighting I didn't, ISIS I didn't say ground. say that. About, I didn't say anything about assassination. I said something very specific. Yeah. You, I would say Trump that's an act of not, war. No, it's not an act of war. It's an assassination. To, an act to of kill war an Iranian involves, commander. I don't understand the point you're making. Well, I'm trying to say if in Iran, if the Iranians killed one of our generals, we would call that an act of war. We do it to them and it's not an act of war. All right. Then I guess we have to differentiate between an act of war and a war. What you have right now with Russia, that's a war. And yeah, Trump I did not engage the U.S. in a war of that sort. And so that was a signal contribution. He also established the Abrahamic Accords, which have got nowhere near enough attention, not near the attention they deserve. And and the people who negotiated that should have won a Nobel Peace Prize because that brings the possibility of peace to the Middle East. And that was, a big, that was a big accomplishment, both of those things. Do you consider the, the giant increase in drone strikes under Trump problematic? What do you mean problematic? You mean desirable? Do, do you because you said, oh, he didn't get us in a new war, but I would consider all those bombings which are illegal, by the way, an act of war. Do you think I didn't that those say that are... Trump, I didn't say that Trump's record was unblemished mm. or that there weren't skirmishes of various sorts. I'm not trying to paint him... Uh, I'm not trying to paint him beige and or I'm not trying to whitewash him. I'm perfectly aware of Trump's flaws and his advantages. 
but he didn't embroil the U.S. in a war. And you guys have been embroiled in a pointless war for, for what? How long now? Since the 1960s? One after uh, another. And then the yeah. Abraham <laughs> Accords are a big deal. And so, and did he betray the working class? Well, I think that's in some sense a vague, it's a vague question. Hillary definitely betrayed the working class because she decided to go with the woke mob instead of her typical, in typic, in, instead of the typical base of power oh. that the Democrats had always relied on. Uh-oh. So can I give you an example? Decision. Can I give sure. you an example on Trump betraying the working class? Because there's a few things you could point to. First of all, there was uh, net outsourcing of jobs under his administration when he campaigned as the opposite. The second thing is his number one legislative accomplishment was a 2017 tax cut where 83 percent of the benefits went to the top one percent. So those are two examples of. You know, he campaigned as the anti outsourcing guy. Then there was net outsourcing under his administration. And in fact, that same tax bill incentivized outsourcing. And then again, that tax bill mostly benefited the wealthy and it didn't help the working class. So that's what I mean by betraying the working class. I think he campaigned in a very populist way. But in terms of how he governed, it was very big surprise that uh, a president votes. Uh, sorry, acts in a way that gets them the most people's votes and then acts in the interest of the powerful. Wow, I've never heard of that happening before. The sort of standard establishment Republican, just like George W. Bush, for example. Yeah, well, I don't have any real comments on that. Like I said, I'm not trying to whitewash the Trump administration. I'm just pointing to a couple of things that he did that mm. he hasn't got credit for. Yeah, you should have got credit for. I actually enjoyed you were on the PBD podcast, I think it was recently, and you made a comment that you found Trump whiny, particularly over the, you know, common refrain that he can't stop saying he thinks the election was stolen. And you know, well, correct I me if I'm wrong, but your commentary well, was like, move on. Well, I think... I think it's a strategic error on his part, at minimum. I mean, Trump portrays himself and thinks of himself as a winner. And part of his attractiveness on the populist front was his unabashed, victorious persona, let's say. And he's the guy that gets things done, and he's the guy that wins. But apparently, the election was stolen from him. And so that begs the question. So that begs the question, is it time for ads? Yes, it is. Sorry, I don't know. Are you the winner and the guy that gets things done? Or are you the guy that lets things be stolen from you? <laughs> and the answer that Trump had always had was, well, I'm not the guy. I'm not that guy. I don't know who else I am, but I'm definitely the winner here. And I think that now campaigning as if he was the uh, victim, let's say, of a plot isn't going to do him any good. I think it was probably a fatal decision from a strategic perspective because mm. it's so off brand. And that has nothing that's completely independent of whatever virtue the argument about the stolen election might have. Well, I don't believe that the that the judiciary in the United States is so corrupt that the, the possibility of a valid finding on the election fra fraud front has been reduced to zero. I don't find that credible. And and I do think so. I also think that that's it's a mistake on that front. And it's a mistake for conservatives. It's a real mistake for conservatives to take that route because conservatives can't say all the institutions are corrupt and untrustworthy. That's what the radical leftists say. And populist conservatives tend to do that. And that really leaves them with nothing except maybe an appeal to public whim. And that's no way to govern. So I think that was a mistake, too. Mm. Uh, you know, you in your commentary, I do often hear a strong defense um, of our institutions. And I do feel like one of the common things that defines the current political era is definitely populism that bubbles up on the left uh, through the vessel of, say, a Bernie Sanders, and even what I would argue was a fake populism that came up on the right with Donald Trump, where the agreement does seem to be, well, hold on, these institutions are really not working for us and they're broken and they're fundamentally corrupt. And, you know, the genesis of it being you have this donor class of corporations and billionaires that donates to politicians and then they get elected and do the bidding of that donor class and the and the corporations. Um, mm -hmm. Do you disagree with that analysis? Do you think that that's just overstating well, the problem and the institutions well, are actually I healthy or? Well, uh, I think it's partly a Tower of Babel problem. So 
I've been listening a fair bit to Russell Brand, who I quite like. Mm. Russell is very, very smart. He's definitely one of the smartest people I've ever met. He's unbelievably sharp. And he differs in his political utterances from me to a substantial degree, although there's a fair bit of commonality as well. He's more, he's beating the anti-capitalism drum in a manner that I tend not to. But there's a specific reason for that. And the reason is that Russell has realized that size is a problem. And, you know, the the lefties tend to be skeptical of big government and the right wingers tend to be. Sorry, the lefties tend to be ska- skeptical of big, big companies right. and the right wingers tend to be skeptical of big government. Right. And I think the right way forward through all that mess is that we should be skeptical of big. All right, guys, what you just saw was. What you just saw was an advertisement. Okay. Anyway. So, yeah, these are these are what like uh, teaser clips for the actual for the actual video. But anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed um, Jordan Peterson just annihilating uh, Trump. Well, you know, in his nice way. Uh, hit the like, hit the sub, hit all for notifications. Drop me a donation like Hunter M, Adrian R, Tom and Bobby, Dylan Renaissance Press, Brian, Andrew, and Alan. Shadows to you. Most recent purchase of Strategist Guide Seduction. Go buy my books at bit.ly slash Helios Books. My early access content can be found at patreon.com slash the Helios Blog. And if you'd like coaching, just go to the Helios Blog at gmail.com. That's my email. And I'll slot you right in. Thank you so much for listening, guys, especially if you listen to the end. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves. And I'll see you next time.